Good morning. Can you believe it's already July 12th? What a year it's been. I wanted to share with you one of the best graphic presentations of our COVID-19 situation that I've seen. This is from the Vanderbilt Microbiome Initiative, and it clearly shows what a mistake Nashville made rushing into phase three of reopening. The data shows clearly that the increase in cases is not because we're testing more. In fact, the percentage of the people who are being tested that test positive is also at a high, all-time high. And I share this with you this morning only to remind you to continue being vigilant in protecting yourself and protecting your neighbors. Before Steve graces us with our prelude this morning, I'd like to share with you a poem that speaks to our current situation. It was written by our beloved sister, Pam Hopkins. My prayer is that this helps you all prepare for worship this morning. The poem is titled, Now's the Time. Now's the time to have faith, to have belief, to have imagination, to be kind. Now's the time to have hope, to have a smile. We are not alone. We may not have our usual support. We are needing strength. We are needing the touch of God. We are needing help to survive. Now's the time to ask for help and to expect it. God does exist. This isn't it. This isn't all there is. This isn't revelation. This isn't hell. This is the time we are challenged to live our faith, to live with love. Now is the time. Once again, thank you, Pam Hopkins, for sharing your gifts with us. Now I invite you all to quiet your minds, open your hearts, and let's worship together. Take it away, Steve. Good morning, Ash Hill. Let us now join together in our call to worship. Early in the morning, we gather at the edge of heaven, finding the gates flung wide open by the one who welcomes all. Early in the morning, we come to this holy place of worship 
to be touched by the one who offers us grace and love. Early in the morning, we worship God who adopt us into his family to be filled by the one who will pour us out in the service to the world. I invite you to join us now for our prayer of confession. God, if we carry excess baggage on life's journey, teach us to travel more simply. If our possessions own us, free us to trust you and share with others. If our need for control keeps us anxious and demanding, help us to relax. If we carry loads of guilt, may we hand them over to you, trusting you to forgive us. God, make us simple, simple in trust, simple in life, simple in commitment to you. Prepare us for your mission. Allow us to join your labor to heal the hurting, feed the hungry, and bring good news to the poor. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In sorrow so deep, we cannot find our way out. God cradled us in comfort. In moments so dark, we stumble over ourselves. God lights the way. Enjoy which cascades into our souls. God fills us with healing. Even when we cannot see it, God's hope is all around us, surrounding us with peace and healing. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we would grow with you. New shoots reaching out, hands stretched upward, like leaves newly formed, soaking up your light and warmth. Lord, we grow with you. 
in the sunshine and rain, in darkness and light, in cold days and summer days, from springtime to winter. Lord, we would grow with you and bring forth fruit that is pleasing to you, fed by your living water, giving substance to others. Lord, we would grow with you. Amen. I invite you now to take a few moments in prayerful reflection over the prayer concerns lifted up by our congregation. Today are scripture readings from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. And I'm going to go ahead and read verses 1 to 23. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen. A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they didn't have much soil, and they sprung up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. 
but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell upon the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Now, scholars believe that the next five verses were added much later, and they were added as a way of explaining this parable to future generations. It's important to remember that Jesus probably didn't actually speak these words, but yet here they are. Verse 18. Hear the parable of the sower. Whenever anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of this word, the person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. It's the word of God for the people of God. It's a great reading. At this time in history, when Jesus spoke these words, farming had become central in the flourishing of the human species. This makes farming and the earth's productive possibilities very fertile ground for teaching the life-affirming lessons to the people who walk the earth at the time of Jesus. It is a little different for us in 2020, but there's, it's making a comeback anyway. But today, we still remain separated by several degrees from the soil and from the food that we eat. Most of us have lost connection with our dynamic relationship with the earth and the soil. In Jesus' story, seeds fall along the well-traveled path. Some fall on rocky grounds and others fall in thorns. And some fall upon healthy and fertile soil. And they sprout and mature differently. And as I mentioned, the second part of the reading goes beyond the original parable. It was added later in an effort to lock down an interpretation for future readers. In it, the seeds fall in the various types of ground representing the good news of God's love, and we, the people of God, are the types of soil onto which they fall. So if this story, in this story, we're the soil, some of us good, some of us bad. And many a great sermon has been preached on this traditional understanding of the parable. But I have problems with this traditional interpretation, because it labels people as being of different value to God, and that doesn't fit. For example, to me, if this means that God views some people as rocky soil, some are covered in thorns, and some are fertile soil, I don't believe that God views different groups of people as being better than other groups of people. That's something a white supremacist would believe, but not people of faith. We believe that God loves all people fully and completely. Using this parable with the interpretation of humans being the soil is inconsistent with the very nature of God. This means we need to circle back around and look beyond the traditional interpretations. Whenever a parable is explained in Scripture, you can be darn sure the explanation was not something Jesus actually said. In fact, explaining a parable tends to rob future generations of what God might be saying to them in their time. And today's reading is a great example of that. Because parables have a way of talking to us in our own time in ways that God intended in our current context. So my approach in today's sermon, in today's reading, 
is to end it where Jesus' original words likely ended. So let's consider what it might mean to us from that perspective today. Okay, if the sower in this version is God, then what if the seeds are God's beloved children, not the soil? It really makes so much more sense to accept that the seeds are all equally loved by God. And when they fall on different types of soil, some flourish and some don't. The variables that dictate success or failure are not the seeds as much as the different growing environments. It's not different classes of people. They are simply different growing environments, environments that, by the way, we are all responsible for preparing so that the seeds, all the seeds, have an equal opportunity to flourish. So yes, to me, as is usually the case in parables, it becomes very clear that Jesus' original version of this story can faithfully be understood as a parable about social justice and faithful community. So hear me out on this. Think about it this way. The first set of seeds Jesus describes are the ones that fall on a beaten path and are easily eaten up by birds. Now, if the seeds are people, then the birds must represent something much larger than people. In other words, they would represent the structures and systems that devour people. The seeds represent people who are swallowed up by the destructive forces of capitalism, systemic racism, mass incorporation, authoritarian governments, and even war. In Jesus' day, it was most likely the Roman Empire. So a scary thought for us is to realize that our equivalent in 2020 is the empire of the United States. No single country can become a global superpower without swallowing up God's beloved children along the way. A country whose economic foundation was built directly on the back of slavery a country that has leveraged the economic foundation built through slavery to gain an economic upper hand on the rest of the world is certainly an empire more concerned with itself than creating healthy soil for God's children to grow. And whenever a country is more concerned about economic growth than the growth of human beings, harm is going to be widespread. Look around. That's what we live in. The second set of seeds were the ones that fell on rock and withered for lack of moisture. These seeds could represent people who are not actively swallowed up by systems and structures, but those who suffer from pure neglect from the community that surrounds them. The victims of underdevelopment, gentrification, lack of quality education, health care, and housing the lack of role models and mentors, the perpetuation of concentrated areas of poverty, poverty that have done so much harm to people in the last 50 or 60 years. The seeds that fall in this type of unhealthy soil try as best they can are not provided enough nourishment to flourish. And something that we have learned here is that once children have missed the critically important early childhood nourishment, they're going to be so far behind, most will never catch up. That's why Nancy Crutcher and the Moms of Edge Hill started Edge Hill Early Learning. It must continue, and it's going to require large investments to make it sustainable, to help it grow, to positively change the lives of more children. Quick side note, when I speak of neglect, I'm not talking about the neglect of the parents and the grandparents of their children growing up over here in our neighborhood. I'm talking about the neglect of the larger community that have allowed this soil to remain so rocky and so difficult to grow to begin with. In most cases, the parents and grandparents are doing the absolute best they can to give their young seeds a chance to grow. But let's look at the third set of seeds. 
The seeds that fall among thorns and are choked out. These are destroyed, not by forces larger than themselves or by neglect, but by many fellow plants, which obviously represent fellow human beings. These seeds could represent people that are damaged by child abuse, violent crime, sexual assault, human trafficking, broken families. It's wherever broken people hurt other people. And it creates a never-ending generational cycle of violence and neglect. But the fourth set of seeds, these are the seeds lucky enough to fall on fertile soil and grow into healthy plants that not only produce fruit, but continue to thrive and nourish others. This last set of seeds represent people who usually, because of the pure accident of birth, are lucky enough to fall into social situations that are not hampered by structures and systems or by neglect or by other personal forces that do harm. These are the people who have the best access to what they need, not only to survive the day, but to thrive healthy nutrition, quality education, health care, family structures, and healthy community. These are the people who also have the greatest moral and spiritual obligation to see to the health of all the other types of soil. These are the gardeners tasked with preparing the soil for all future generations of seeds to grow. Bottom line is this. We, as God's beloved family, must take responsibility for the health of all the soil so that all the seeds have an opportunity not only to sprout, but to grow into adulthood in happy and healthy ways. So that they then can also care for the soil across this community and the planet. I think that under this justice-oriented interpretation of this scripture, the seeds fall into their social situation. It's passive. They fall in. Be that social situation healthy or unhealthy, at no fault of their own. It's through the pure accident of birth. This, my friends, might be at the core of white privilege. And I'm not saying successful white people haven't faced struggles or don't face struggles. They do. But their struggles never come because of the color of their skin. That's not why they face struggles. I certainly believe that people do have the ability to lift themselves up from a terrible environment from time to time. But this particular parable reminds those who like to blame the victims just how difficult it really is when everything is stacked against you from the very beginning. You see, Jesus taught us how to turn the entire earth into a fertile garden. And it's by listening to his teachings and following in the way of God's love, compassion, and mercy, while always fighting for justice and then acting in ways that help change the world. Only then can all of God's seeds have a chance to reach their full potential. And that's what we do at Edge Hill. And we do this through the brighter days after school and summer programs most years, obviously not this summer. But those programs provide nutrition, social and emotional support, and education resources for the children in the Edge Hill neighborhood. It has helped generations of children. But as I mentioned, our future is in helping nourish the even younger plants during those important early childhood education years in the Edge Hill Early Learning Program. Yes, it is bigger than what we can do on our own. But with God's help and spiritually mature ministry partners, we can make this happen. And it must be a priority for the body of Christ known as Edge Hill. Amen. Now is the call to our offering. And on behalf of the kids in the neighborhood and the parents and the grandparents, 
we would like to say thank you to Edge Hill for your continued love and support throughout the Edge Hill community. Thank you so much. I invite you to go in peace, receiving God's grace every step of the way. Go out and be a gardener. Go and care for yourself and your neighbor in all that you do. Amen.